Thank you, Dr. Dharal, for uh, summarizing the whole of uh, literature and giving a bird's eye view of um, what are the drugs to be That's used and, the, and then the sequence of uh, usage of the drugs. Any questions from uh, any of the audience? Probably we can take it. I have one question to the to the nephrologist, Dr. Mehta. He, is he around? Yes, I'm around. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors have been found to be nephroprotective in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The same cannot be said in patients with preserved ejection fraction. Any particular reason for this major difference? So, see, basically, uh, one of the mechanisms where SGLT2 inhibitors work is at the level of proximal tubule, and that is the site where maximum amount of sodium is reabsorbed. So, it is like a diuretic, though not in the true sense, but it's it's like an expensive diuretic only. So, maybe with res, uh, preserved re ejection fraction, uh, they don't need so much of uh, diuresis and diuresis as much as those patients. And that could be one reason. That's my just wild guess. Otherwise, I have no answer to this. Is there the difference in degree of renal dysfunction in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus reduced? Is the, is the heart kidney function more worse in patients with reduced than preserved? Would there one be reason that uh, this may be no, the difference? I mean, sir, yes. Uh, with, uh, with advancing CKD, we know that EF drops. But uh, it's the other way also. I mean, we, we have so many patients with uh, CKD stage 4, stage 5 who have fairly well preserved 45-50% of ejection fraction. So again, that is uh, the EF and uh, uh, progression of CKD is not correlated because it is also uh, related to the etiology of uh, CKD. Like for example, a diabetic kidney disease will always progress uh, uh, more rapidly uh, in spite of controlling everything, including the LVEF, etc as opposed to non-DKD, which includes mainly the tubular interstitial disorders. Those have decent urine output, they never have pedal edema, and uh, they maintain better hemoglobin, and maybe their ejection fraction is better preserved than those who have proteinuria and uh, water retention. Dr. Dalal, uh, uh, I think you made the right point, actually, uh, because when they've done the uh, when they have done the breakdown of uh, by GFR as to which uh, GFRs uh, actually benefit the most, it is the CKD3 which benefits the most in terms of uh, degree of uh, benefit uh, uh, with the SGLT2. And uh, the, the thing is, by the time uh, the kidney function falls to much lower levels, uh, the the benefit of SGLT2 will be there, but it is not uh, 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 it is not as much as it is in mildly reduced. Uh, traditionally, we have known benefit only in those patients who have been shown to benefit all the parameters, even the non-albuminic uric uh, uh, CKD or uh, uh, renal failure. Uh, that is also benefited with the help of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is the first class of drugs which benefits non-albumin uric uh, renal failure. That is uh, uh, a very great benefit of SGLT2. Can I have a um, couple of questions, please? Dr. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> My question is to Dr. Bansal. Uh, yeah. Is the MRA effect, is it uh, dose-related? Because the definite risk-benefit ratio is dependent on the dose. Is yes, the uh, uh, dose-related? Yes. 25 and 50 milligram? Uh, yes, sir. Sir, the most commonly used dose, the most commonly used dose has been 25 milligrams. Yeah, beyond, sir, beyond 50 milligrams, the benefits do not occur incrementally but the side effects grow the incidence of hyperkalemia grows yeah between 25 and 50 as i said the most commonly used strength of spironolactone is 25 although as 
lanes you can upgrade it to 50 whereas for a pleranon the median dose used in emphasis and uh, fss both was about 40 the the incidence of hyperkalemia phenomenally increases the few in these the dose that is the major problem so you don't and you we never go beyond 50 mg with lerenon and 25 with aspirinolactam that's the <coughs> as regards this arni dr ponde in majority of our patients we are unable to go beyond 100 mg a day what is your experience particularly in ref yeah uh, my personal experience has been in my patients only around 10 to 15% of the time i am able to reach 200 mg twice a day in another majority 50% i am able to reach uh, 100 mg twice a day and the remaining 30% remain at 50 mg twice a day i just cannot increase the dose so majority we are able to reach uh, 100 mg twice a day but to reach 200 is very very difficult uh, in indian patients uh, dr bansal Uh, about five percent of patient in the Fidelio and Figarin trial were all three drugs: SGLT2, uh, RAS, and the Pineron. So, any data available on this yes, subject? Yes, I don't know what is the data on this subject. Sir, I am also not aware of the details of uh, both these trials. What I could get to was the gross, uh, uh, you know, very gross information regarding this. um uh, in fact a couple of months ago there was um, uh, a meeting with uh, an american nephrologist i i think praful would recall he was there in that uh, meeting um the the benefit is there in almost all the groups in, <coughs> including those patients who are on Uh, uh, these drugs, but these are patients predominantly not of heart failure. The underlying disease is chronic kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, to be uh, precise. That is the only uh, category which has been studied. We'll have more data. People are doing trials uh, with finerenon. We are also a part of uh, one of the trials called the Fine Art Study, uh, which we are doing uh, with finerenon. And in some times to come, we'll have more and more data. Dr. Pondey uh, or any other speaker, initiation of SDLT2 in CKD is easier compared to RAS blockers. So there's a thinking going on. Why not SDLT2 first and then RAS? This would be easier, and ultimately we are going to use both the drugs. So your opinion on this? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, in fact yesterday only we discussed this point that when the pressures, blood pressures are borderline, when the EGFR is moderately reduced, and you have a patient who is Relatively non-compliant or something like that. Once a day administration of SGLT2 will be very easier to start with uh, for a week or two, and at the end of two weeks you can definitely introduce uh, army at that point of time. When the pressures, blood pressures are better, when your loop diuretics of the of they are off the board, uh, so definitely the new sequencing has its own uh, own merits. No question about that, sir. Yes, sir. I think all of us will agree that it's much easier to use SGLT2 than Arni for sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, I highlighted that much I, problems, I, and you can start <laughs> on SGLT2 without too much worry. Once you start Arni, then all the creatinine issues and the blood pressure fall starts. Actually, I highlighted in my second case that very pro- issue that you would want to definitely follow. And again, I also made it a point that the man who gave you Arni as well as the DAPA, that man has come up with this. It's a new paradigm that we are talking about. So long as you have all four on board as early as possible, it's fine. But this particular patient with the CKD component on the borderline, definitely all of us would agree to get on with SGLT2 inhibitors prior to Arni. Also, the other issue. Having as having, I wanted to ask of if if the chairperson permits me of Dr. Hemant Mehta. So we use now. SGLT2 inhibitors as heart failure medication moving uh, moving away from your take on DAPA CKD and what is the role of SGLT2 inhibitors in your practice for non diabetic kidney disease do you ever use it and how to what extent so if we look at the evolution of the practice and dosing of SGLT2 <laughs> so the earlier one said that don't use it for EGFR of less than 60 Then for EMPA and DEPA, they came down to less than forty-five, uh, uh, but uh, CANA still remained at sixty. 
depas uh, ckd was the first trial where they went down from that cut off of uh, 45 to 30 and they enrolled patients up to egfr of 25 not only that they continued to use depa even if the egfr they, the initial dose uh, egfr had to be more than 25 but if ckd progressed and egfr fell to say 20 15 or the till the patient reached the stage of dialysis they continued to use depagliflozin so that that was the basic uh, difference uh, compared to the other studies and that was also that they started using it for non diabetic patients earlier like it was a drug meant for uh, causing uh, glucose control but uh, they found benefits in uh, non diabetic patients they found patient uh, benefits in uh, non uh, proteinuric patients also as if you look at the first trial which came with uh, empagliflozin the one of the finding of that trial was that so it reduces proteinuria so, and that's why it's going to be effective so what's the uptake amongst nephrologists for this molecule as far as renal protection is concerned yes. and till what egfr levels would you initiate i i personally do yeah. out of changing his prognosis that patient's prognosis yeah. so up to 30 gfr we would safely use it and then monitor as as i said we have to we are still on the learning curve because uh, it is quite possible like after starting the uh, as or arb uh, even after starting uh, sglt2 in the first 14 days patient will come cribbing that my creative you have co- uh, you said this drug will cause uh, renal protection but you have caused a rise in my creatinine and mind you patients are very very sensitive even if the creatinine goes off from 1.6 to 1.7 they are grossly upset that you have caused this uh, decline in my kidney function so we have to be very careful so like we have to learn certain things like uh, with as and arb first and foremost ensure that patient is well hydrated if possible try to take them off loop diuretics for few days when you introduce this new drug make sure that creatinine stabilizes here in this case uh, whereas potassium also is an issue with acrb and then slowly go uh, uh, further uh, adding uh, whatever other drugs are required so for dkd patients acrb first or sglt dapa first i'm asking you a pointed question yeah see among the nephrologist uh, it, there is still Uh, you know more conviction about acrb because they have been there around for a long time for uh, you know proteinuria reduction and this is a new drug so people are now you know starting to learn about for, it uh, for us heart failure guys it's become an old drug already uh, i know i know <laughs> for us heart failure guys <laughs> no no the, re- the reason is this initial decline in gfr number 1 and this uh, additional side side effect of osmotic uh, nephropathy or nephrosis which has been described so that's the reason the nephrologists are uh, more uh, very uh, very about you know using it okay, up front and we have uh, yeah uh, sglt2 inhibitors in subgroup analysis has shown to decrease potassium also yes. one of the subgroup analysis 50% what is the mechanism it is uh, same, same same mechanism it acts as a diuretic uh, reduce so if it it causes uh, uh, more sodium reabsorption at the proximal tubular level uh, your uh, ultrafiltrate which is reaching to the distal tubular level has more potassium and that is where your uh, potassium will not be absorbed because there's so much of potassium there so it will also be excreted along with that's that's the mechanism so one of the reasons why dr mcmore said the first drug should be dapa along with beta blockers with the understanding that any potential precipitation of heart failure by introducing beta blockers is taken care of by the dapa which can cause a what do you call reduction in the total body water as people should realize that the dapa is not a diuretic in the strict sense of the word and actually the studies have shown that the dapa glucosin and for that matter all the hgt inhibitors they reduce the interstitial fluid more than the circulating blood volume and they do not activate the renin angiotensin system unlike the other diuretics so although if the initial effect may be due to osmotic diuretics in the long run it fails to act like a diuretic it does something which we are not able to understand as of today but it does decrease the total body water dr mahapatra if there are no more questions i think we'll close the session okay
Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, to all the speakers, uh, starting from Professor Dr. C. K. Ponde, Dr. Prakula Karakar, Dr. Sadi Bansa, Dr. Sadaran Sethi, Dr. G. R. Kani, Dr. Hemant Kumar, and Dr. J. J. Dalal. All of them have done a very wonderful job, and the, the, the discussion part was very okay. And also, we are thankful and obliged to the three our eminent chairpersons, Dr. Daya Sagar Rao, Dr. Ayi Satyamuti, Dr. Sarma was absent. So, thank you very much.